Welcome to this week's episode of Startups for the Rest of Us. As always, I'm your host, Rob Walling. This week, I talk with Colin Gray, the founder of The Podcast Host and Alitu. It's a really interesting conversation as I follow Colin from his days of building a hobby project in podcast hosting to hiring a freelancer to start producing shows then starting to create educational content, creating courses, and finally building a SaaS app on top of that. Very much a stair-step approach in action. But before we dive into that, I wanted to let you know that Tiny Seed Batch 3 applications are open as of yesterday. You can head to tinyseed.com. If you run a SaaS app with revenue, I would really encourage you to apply. You can head to tinyseed.com to learn more about the funding and mentorship and guidance we provide in our year-long remote accelerator program. And at tinyseed.com, you'll see an apply here button. And it typically takes people 10 to 15 minutes to apply. It's not a huge process. And I would love to connect with you and learn more about your company if you're interested in potentially being part of Tiny Seed Batch 3. On a separate note, I wanted to mention that I often get contacted with private questions that folks don't want to appear on the podcast. It's things like, hey, I'm thinking through an exit, you know, potentially I have an acquisition offer or some interest, or I'm, I need to potentially fire a co-founder, you know, pretty tough things that, that you can't have on the air. But one that I do get relatively frequently, and I think it's because I've been so public about growing Drip and then, and then selling it, is should I sell my company? Should I think about selling my company? What, what does that entail? Or even I have an offer or I have someone sniffing around and I'm thinking about selling, you know, what, what should I do? And I, I'll tell you, I've received these emails and it is such a life-changing moment that there can be such a huge swing from selling for net profit versus selling for revenue and knowing how to do that and, and what to put in place and, and how to go about that process that I just wanted to make. It's almost a public service announcement that if you're a SaaS app and you are doing at least seven figures in ARR, in my opinion, you should not sell for net profit multiple. You should be selling for a revenue multiple, and these days those multiples are pretty healthy. You can listen back to the interview I did with David Newell of Quiet Light Brokerage, I think it was 20, 30 episodes ago, and I was saying, ah, if you're doing a million, maybe get two to three X, and I believe he came back and said, no, it's like three to four, or maybe three to five X, and if you're doing five or 10 million, the multiples are even larger. And so it's something that I think there's potentially some confusion. You know, I think if you're doing six figures in ARR, yeah, you're probably going to sell for a net profit multiple. But once you get into the millions, there are so many buyers, private equity, strategic, that are willing to pay healthy, healthy prices, life-changing money, you know, never have to work again money. And frankly, if you're thinking about Doing that, I would encourage you to reach out to me, drop me a line, whether you, even if you've, you've had an offer, you've had someone sniffing around, or you know, you're know thinking about doing that, I'm always happy to at least have, a, at a minimum, have an email conversation about it. Sometimes I'm able to jump on on a phone call, and, and I know people who who do this, who you know who do the sell side representation of SaaS apps and maximize that value. And there are a couple founders that have asked me for advice, and I've essentially laid out the options as I see them. You know, there are brokers, there are sell side representation, there's sell side SaaS representation, uh, much like Discretion Capital, which is was founded by Anar Volset, my co-founder with Tiny Seed. And, you know, depending on where you are and what you're thinking and what you want to do, there are ways to maximize that value. And it's something, maybe I'll do a whole episode, maybe I'll get Anar on here at some point and talk about how to maximize that value. We have chatted about that on the podcast a bit. But in my mind, it's just very important that the value you build in your company, if you're going to exit, be deliberate about it. Because it can be the difference between selling for a million dollars and selling for five million dollars if if you sell it well and you run the right process. So, you know, I'm just extending an, an open offer. I mean, this is the type of thing of I've been in the business of helping founders for almost 20 years now. And by in the business, I mean doing it for free ef- effectively through the blog and the podcast and mostly free through a, a $20 book. And it's important to me that founders don't get taken advantage of and that as founders, it's so hard to, to get that base hit and to, to make that million dollar, multi-million dollar business that when you exit, I really want you to get the maximum value of it. So if you're not going to sell, that's cool too. Run the business. Be proud that we, we can bootstrap and make these amazing, amazing life-changing outcomes for ourselves. But before you make a permanent decision like selling, I really want you to check out all your options. So look at the landscape and certainly feel free to reach out to me anytime with, you know, such a a big decision as that. 
And with that, I'd like to dive into my conversation with Colin Gray, the founder of The Podcast Host, which is a great educational website about starting podcasts, and the SaaS app Alitu. So let's dive into my conversation. Colin Gray, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. So today we're talking about Alitu, it's A-L-I-T-U, which is your SaaS app. Your H1 is really simple podcast editing for people in a hurry. And it's software that helps people edit their podcast. Um, you built this actually on top of kind of an info product audience that you had built. So the podcasthost.com is your hub. That's where you put out your podcast and your videos and a lot of blogging and written content. And then you sell courses or you sell a membership on there as well. That's very reasonably priced, by the way. I was clicking around, looking at one of the courses, thinking, oh, I want to get this. And you have your, your podcast host academy and it's like $225 a year US. And I was thinking, oh yeah, I might do it just for this one piece of it. Do you, do you really get all the, all the courses for that? You do. And funny you mentioned that because it's someone going through my head at the moment to raise that price. So uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that actually too. For me anyways, I mean, I'm in a different place than I was 10, 15 years ago, but I was like, oh, that seems incredibly reasonable for, for everything you have there. So, so we'll go through the timeline of, of how you built that. But in essence, today, uh, Alitu is after two years after launch, you're doing about $45,000 a month in MRR. That's, that's US. And although you launched the podcast host 10 years ago, it kind of feels, we'll cover this, but it kind of feels like you got really serious about it in the 2014, 2015 range and then started thinking about software. And then it took you, yeah, of course, like everything, it's a bunch of false starts and you built something and eventually it took, uh, what, almost two, three years from when you were thinking about it to launch it. And something I do want to touch on is, is you had this relatively big audience on the podcast host already and people who knew, like, and trusted you. And it took you six months to get to $3,000. I think it's 3,000 US. I'm kind of doing some on the fly conversions here from, from pound sterling, but, but it took you six months to get to 3K and it took you a year to get to 8K, which... That, that had to have been a little tough. Was that a struggle emotionally to have built that audience and to feel like you should just be able to launch something and have everybody buy it and then to take a year to get to that MRR? It was, absolutely. I mean, at that point, we had we had a few thousand visitors a day. So it was a lot of people visiting the site and we had a good mailing list as well. Although, well, I thought it was great at the time, uh, probably 5,000, 6,000, I think, at the time. So I, I, yeah, I was expecting more, certainly. In that first couple of months of launch, I thought we could get up to a few hundred at least. That was my aim, certainly. And that first year was tough, yeah. I mean, it was all funded through the other site. So we managed, and, and the other site, the main site, the content site was doing well. So that kind of kept my spirits up. But yeah, there was, there was quite a few hard points during that first year, for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. And we'll dig into that a little later because I do like to touch on this topic of should you build an audience or not? And, you know, I contest that it's, it's great for info products and that it's a lot less useful for SaaS. And, and I think you're probably an example of that, which is not, I mean, I had no idea before we started talking that that was actually your experience. So I think it'll be, it'll be fun to do that. So for folks listening, when we say the content site, that's thepodcasthost.com, which is all the, that's the videos and the blog and, and the course. And then Alitu is, is the SaaS app that helps folks do the editing. So in November of 2010, decade ago, you launched the podcast host and it was a hobby project that you launched. It was podcast hosting for your own shows. It was, it was one of those um, scratch your own itch things where I was running a bunch of podcasts for a university. So that was my job at the time. I was a learning technologist working at a university in Edinburgh and we started a bunch of podcasts to help teach students. And the nameless podcast host at the time was horribly unreliable, the, the top one at the time. And in fact, one, one course that I was about to run, I had the course starting on the Monday morning and we had to deliver the podcast as part of it. And the whole podcast hosting site went down on the Sunday night and didn't come back up again until the end of the week. And that was it. That was the last straw. I, I ended up just building a WordPress site and setting up podcast hosting myself on there. So that's, that's really how it started. That was why it was called The Podcast Host, <laughs> an unimaginative name. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. And so you're, but you're not still hosting podcasts today. So how long did you do it and, and why did you kill it? Yeah, so it was, it was about a year and a half I did it. And I ran that as a sideline. I grew up to about, I think it was about 150 or so podcasts at the time. And I killed it because 
at the time, there was, there was a few incumbents there. I mean, they hadn't been running for that long. It wasn't that big an industry at the time, but it just felt, it felt almost at the time already that it was commoditized. The prices were really low. It was a really low monthly fee, but the support was, was huge, partly because the tech was pretty undeveloped at the time, actually. Like it was, it was kind of hard to run it, <laughs> to run a podcast back in 2010 still. So I always got a lot of questions around the gear, around the distribution, all that kind of stuff around the hosting. And a lot of that hadn't been solved necessarily at the time. So I'm sure if I'd grown a team around it and got a lot more support around it, I could have done something with it. But it felt like really hard work at the time. And I'm not usually averse to hard work, but it felt like hard work I wouldn't enjoy. So yeah, that's pretty much why. I thought the content would be more fun. And I thought I just, there was other things I wanted to do more. Yeah, I wonder if it's a question of timing, because obviously with new startups, Castos, Transistor, they're obviously having success, part of that due to COVID. But I think that there is, there is and what probably was room for a podcast host. So it's interesting to think that perhaps you were a few years too early. Yeah, there absolutely was. I mean, looking at the other companies that started around that time and the few years following that, I think probably if I'd been more technical, if I'd been a developer, say, I certainly could have started to build some solutions to solve those problems people were having, like those distribution problems, the you know, stuff like that. But it just, it wasn't the direction I wanted to go. There was just so much, <laughs> there was so much customer support. I remember that really clearly. And we get a lot of customer support through Alitu, but for some reason, I really enjoy supporting people through the Alitu process, the creating, the editing. But I didn't enjoy supporting people through the, you know, just the basic distribution, the basic getting their podcast out there. There's, there's, a, there's a strange little difference there, I think. So that was the first couple years then you were writing about podcasting. I'm imagining you're starting to build some SEO traffic, a little bit of an audience. You start this hosting, you, you shut that down. It's probably sometime in 2011. And then in 2015, as, as things are building for you, you took on a freelancer to start working on producing shows for clients and you essentially launched like a productized service that helped produce podcasts. And that ran for the next five years. So that really ran from 2015 up, up until just a few months ago. I think you said you stopped taking clients maybe a year ago, but it, but it really ran until then. What's the story there? Like, did you use that revenue to fund everything else? Or was that a, just another kind of, was it a shiny object? Or was, was it a valuable thing? And, and why did you eventually decide to sunset that? It was really valuable. That was something that it did a couple of things for us, I think. The first one was that it gave me the excuse to take somebody on, a staff member, because it was paid work and I could obviously see the return for his time. So I took on Matthew at the time. He really, his first job was to help with that production and, and we put it out to our mailing list, to the website and really started advertising it and got on about five to 10 clients right away on a weekly basis. It was just a, a monthly fee we started with. And that gave me the confidence to take him on. I don't think I'd have done it otherwise. But strangely enough, that only ended up taking up maybe one or two days of his time. And really the catalyst for growing the rest of what we do was the help Matthew gave me with the content. That really it gave me so much more capacity to create bigger, greater blog posts, do more research into what we should be you know, writing about, covering, running a podcast with him for ourselves as well. So there was the client work gave us that in the first place. And really, we got that up to a decent MRR itself. So it did complement the income of the podcast host quite a bit. But it was more the kind of confidence, I think, to start taking on staff. And and once you've taken on one, taking on the next is so much easier. So having that little impetus at the start, just that really got us going. Yeah, I can, I can see that. So then why did you decide to shut it down in the end? Yeah, so... Scalability, essentially. We did enjoy it. We do miss that work, actually. I talk to Matthew about this all the time, the fact that we we always talk about trying to take on some more exciting big projects with clients because it's great fun, like making those stories for people and working with people to get their story out there. But it just takes up so much time. And the last project I did, I actually worked on a project directly, did the narration, all that kind of stuff. That was just last year. And it just, I got to the point where I'd spent two days scripting and narrating a show and realizing how much more value I could have got out of that time working on Alitu, working on the marketing for it. So while we loved that work, it was just not scalable for what we wanted to do. And it just wasn't the giving the value to the company that it, that it should have, that the, my time should have been given. I know what you're talking about. And in fact, now that I'm 
able to to work a lot on projects that I want to work on, I have circled back to doing that kind of work. That's what Tiny Seed Tales is for me, is it's my ability to sit there and script and produce a show because I don't need to focus and grow, push so hard like I used to on the SaaS apps I was growing. And so it makes a lot of sense, but but I enjoy it. That's what I'm doing now out of choice, right? Tiny Seed Tales obviously has, there's a business purpose to it, but frankly, you know, we started doing it because I really wanted to. So I totally get that feeling of, man, this is fun, but how do I justify spending two days when really I could have grown MRR, launched a new feature, you know, done some some SEO or whatever? And to an extent, it, it, it is worth it in a way because we, we created a show at one point called Hostile Worlds, which was a fun audio drama thing around space. And Matthew and I created that. And it was that was almost our portfolio piece. And I, th- I feel like when you're in a space like ourselves, when it's creative, when it's, it's quite reputation based almost, that you have to have something good like that to show that you know what you're talking about. So then, especially when we're, we're the creating app, we're not hosting, we're not just purely technical, we're the creating, the creative editing production app. And I think having that behind us in our portfolio, that does help. So yeah, I think it was definitely worthwhile, but it was, it was just something to move on from. So in 2014, 2015, you were running, you told me you were running eight different businesses at once and that it wasn't, wasn't as glamorous as it sounds. You know, Richard Branson runs eight businesses, but let's just say he has staff in place to manage them. So I'm imagining you running around with your hair on fire. And the question I want to ask you is between, let's say 2007 and probably 2011-ish, 2012, I did something similar where I had about 10, at any given time, it was between eight and 12 different businesses running. But a lot of them were these small websites that were effectively on autopilot until something happened to them. So a lot of them were based either on Google ads, display ads, or SEO. And they had traffic on autopilot and the conversion rates were consistent. And so they would generate between the lowest one is probably doing about 600, 700 a month. And the the highest one was doing in the five to 7,000 a month range. And so I packed those all together and that was my four hour work week in essence. Like I, I worked literally 10 hours a week for a pretty long time, but it was because the businesses didn't require a bunch of staff. I had some virtual assistants, but they were very task based folks. Didn't require a lot of staff. They didn't require a ton of support. They didn't require a ton of marketing or new features. And I wasn't trying to grow any of them, right? I was focused at the time on writing my book and starting MicroConf and the podcast and stuff. But if any of those had needed to grow, if I was trying to build or grow eight businesses at once or 10 businesses, that would have been insanity. But for me, it was a lot of autopilot bouncing around working on what I wanted to do. So with that context in mind, 2015, you're running eight businesses. Were you trying to grow and launch eight businesses at once or were a lot of them kind of running themselves? Yeah, no, the the former, definitely the trying to grow. I mean, I would have I would have loved to be in a situation where they were they were making minimum of seven hundred and up to a few thousand. This was really this was really the time where I was trying to get out of my full time employment. I was still around that time, 2014, 2015, I was I was still doing a PhD actually. That's what I was trying to get out of. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. My my approach actually, I had a few like that. I had a few passive businesses which were content-based, SEO-based. In fact, Alitu, we could get into slightly where the story for that came because I bought Alitu as a business directory. That was what the domain was. It was a business directory, alitu.com, which I then repurposed later on. But my approach was more, I found people who knew a subject, who had expertise, and I was a technical person behind it. So one example was my brother, actually. So we had a, he is in beer, craft beer, runs bars, distributes beer. And so we set up a box, a beer box business, sending out boxes of curated, really high quality craft beer. And it was a subscription based business. And we started to run that. So that was one of those experiments, for example. And there was a few others like that as well. And none of them got to above maybe a thousand dollars MRR apart from the podcast host. That was the one that took off. So it was the one that kind of separated itself from the pack. And I was, I was glad by the end of that year to bin quite a lot of the other ones that never got past a few hundred. So yeah, it, it, it was, it was a tough year, certainly. Yeah. And that's the advice I give to folks when they ask, should I start two businesses at once or three, or I hear them say, I'm working on these three businesses is always do one at a time. Like you can own multiple businesses 
I don't think you can grow multiple businesses at once because of the focus that it takes, unless you are in that Richard Branson situation where you have a bunch of budget and you truly have GMs or CEOs or someone who's just has the owner mindset. But if you have task-based or project-based people, you're going to be doing too much management and requires too much of that entrepreneurial drive, I think, in order to, to actually grow small businesses where you're kind of, you're spinning most of the plates, you know, you don't have all the support. Yeah, I was. I do agree with you that it's very hard. It, it's near impossible to grow that many businesses. Certainly, even two or three all simultaneously. But I do, I do think back to that time and think I didn't know the podcast host was going to take off. It wasn't at a living level at that point. The other ones did look promising, and they could have potentially worked. But I do see it as a bit of a an experiment and worthwhile almost spending at least three to six months on that on that experiment even if it's going to be a very very tough six months I'm glad I tried them all I don't regret not starting those other ones which I think I would have otherwise because we had a lot of conversations around them and and I didn't know the podcast host was going to work so it's a it's a tough decision and you're absolutely right you have to make a choice sooner rather than later but I do sometimes think that over focusing can be slightly dangerous so yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the exact right advice is there, but there's there's definitely different paths. Yeah, I think that's helpful sentiment to to think about not wanting to limit too early because you don't know what's going to take off. So then in April 2016, you start coming up with ideas to help your existing audience and you want to you want to do something in software. What was that switch? away from, or not even away from, but in addition to the content and everything that you're giving to your audience, you wanted to make a software play. I'm curious to hear about, you know, not only why you made that decision, but then how you went about coming up with the idea for Alitu. Yeah. The main reason was competition, actually, honestly. It was it was becoming really hard to sell education and content at the time, info products in our area. There was a fair few people coming out with different courses. There was a lot of, there was a fair few people actually starting or running software products and giving away what we would consider a paid course for free as a lead magnet for their software. And it was just becoming really difficult to, it was becoming difficult to generate an income, a decent income through that, that software. And I could see that just getting worse and worse in the future. So I wanted to create something that just had more of a moat, something that was more difficult to copy. And so I considered a few different things. We considered the hosting side of things again, considered a few different approaches. And it was really the, the editing was the part that we were asked about all the time. To create content, we've got a bunch of different ways that we ask people questions to really get ideas for our blog posts, for our podcast, all that kind of stuff. And the one question that always comes up is, how can I make editing easier? How can I make podcast editing take less time and be less technical so I don't have to worry about what's what's compression, what's equalization, what's normalization? I don't care about these terms. I just want it to sound good. And I just thought, I'm sure there's a way to automate this because it's quite procedural in a lot of ways. Thinking back to our podcast production days, like a lot of this, we actually set up templates for people's shows. And so it's actually quite easy to do it week by week. So that was that was really what started it. It was that kind of that competition side of things, the mo and, and scalability as well, just being able to thinking towards how could we get something that could get thousands of users in here because education just isn't going that direction for us. Right. You're making some money, but not not as much as you wanted. And I think scalability is often, like you said, the big, big thing people seek in software. And so that's early, that's spring of 2016. And you started inviting testers like I'm assuming beta testers, it wasn't until August of 2017, so about 15 months later. And then I guess you were actually inviting them January of 2018. So that's like more than a year and a half later, almost two years later. And then you eventually launched it to paid users in June of 2018. So it's like 27 months. I mean, that's a really long time. It must have, at least it, it feels long to me on paper. Did it feel that way to you? And, and why did it take that long? It did. It did feel that long. <laughs> I think a big part of the problem was I was a non-technical founder trying to bootstrap a software company. So I had some income from the podcast host, but you know I didn't want to take on five developers all at once. I wanted to build it in a way that was sustainable. I wanted to build it in a way that was definitely validated so that I wasn't putting 50 grand into something that didn't actually work. So, do you know, I say it felt like a long time and it did feel like a long time, but it never felt like too long. It never felt like too long. It actually always felt like we were moving at a decent pace. I remember the first four or five months I worked with one back-end developer to build 
the technical prototype. And this looked like, it looked horrible. It was just a terrible, terrible interface. It wasn't designed to be a good interface, but it was just, it was to showcase the back end technology to show that we could do decent processing, bunch all the clips together, add some music with some fades. And that took about five months, but there was so much progress, like seeing these little things like, oh, look, the fades are working now. That's great. The music is fading into the voice and it sounds brilliant. And this is happening every time without me having to do anything. And then going into the design, that was another few months. And that always felt like a bit of progress every day. And then actually implementing that design. So it always felt like a long time, but I was never in an enormous rush because I didn't, I didn't want to ever go unprofitable. And actually we never did. We never went unprofitable through the whole thing. So um, I always funded it through the podcast host income. And I, that's, I was happy to go at the pace that that allowed that's really nice. I mean, it's like a stair-step approach, right? It's like your step one and two businesses were the podcast host. It was an info, essentially an information product course that you are selling and you're, you're bringing in traffic through SEO and content marketing. And that allowed you to buy out your time so you didn't have to work full-time for anyone else to own your time, to invest in, in a little bit of, of revenue on top, it sounds like, a little bit of excess to then hire one developer to work on it. It's, it's a nice approach. It takes you a lot longer to get there, but you can do it profitably. You do it on your own terms. And I think just given that amount of time, you, you have a high likelihood of eventually finding something that's going to work. So that's interesting. That So you launch in middle of 2018. You have this big audience. We touched on this earlier. You had a mailing list. You, you had primed people. And yet you launched to, in essence, after six months, you only had about 3000 US, $3,000 in MRR. And after a year, you had about 8000 You gave me pound sterling, but I'm converting to, to US dollars. So about $8,000 after a year, about 12,000 MRR after 18 months, which was right before COVID. Then when COVID hit, presumably you hit, you had a really big spike, as I know a lot of kind of remote communication and, and podcast stuff happened. So that was obviously a big boon. But even after 18 months, you were, you know, around 12K MRR, but you had this big audience. So what, what's the disconnect there? Do you think that, that the audience, you know, a lot of people are aspirational and want to buy an a info product or a course that they may or may not implement versus buying a tool and using a tool and paying for it every month is such a different ball game. That's kind of, you know, my hypothesis, but I'm curious, you've lived this firsthand. What happened there? Do you know, I think the biggest disconnect in the whole thing, well, I think there was two parts to it. I think one part was that we had been marketing the education to our audience a fair bit. And so they were probably, they enjoyed our content, certainly, but we had, we had tired them out a little bit at the time, potentially. But more than that, I think, potentially, was that I had slightly underestimated, or maybe heavily underestimated, how specific our audience was because I, we'd been creating general podcast content on our blog and I, this might apply to many other areas too so I hope it's useful but certainly I thought we were creating general podcast content and we had a general podcast audience but it turned out that actually the content we were creating the most popular stuff was actually quite technical so we were writing about gear we were writing about software writing about recording editing all that kind of stuff and so the people we were attracting I believe, looking back on it, were actually quite technical people in the first place. They were those DIY podcasters, which were really happy to come in and play around with all the gadgets and the gear. And those people are far less likely to pay $28 a month for something that takes away their technical troubles, <laughs> because a lot of them quite enjoy playing around with that stuff. I think that was the biggest disconnect in the early days. And I realized that only about six months to 12 months in. And that's when we started creating a lot more content that focused towards the audience that I hadn't reached at all before, which was more the businesses, more the entrepreneurs, the solo founders, the, the people that are trying to grow a personal brand. And therefore they don't give a they don't care about the technical stuff. They don't they don't care about how to edit and all the terms and all that kind of stuff. They just want it done for them. I think that was a big part of it that I hadn't realized actually how specific or how niche our audience was until we tried to sell them something that was on the opposite end of that niche. And once you created that content for the more, as you said, the, the solo founders or the business people, 
do they find you via SEO on a monthly basis where they stumble upon an article and they read it and they go, or have they become part of your audience? And when I say audience, I mean, they're subscribing to your list, they're following what you do and they're sticking around. Yeah, for sure. That latter one. Yeah. They've become part of our audience now because we've, I've always been good at the the funnel side of things. That was something that always really interested me. I find it quite fun. It's, it's kind of a game, like figuring out how to give people content they really want, they're interested in, how to give them something else they're even more interested in, sign up to the email list, to then get on to, you know, the first product, at maybe a few dollars, that kind of stuff. I really enjoy that. And as we start to create content that attracted the far less technical people, I could see them coming in, asking us questions. So it's always a really engaged audience, I find, podcasters. They, they ask you lots of stuff. They get in touch all the time. They're not afraid to, to get in touch and ask for some freebies. And so we started building that funnel up. And they, they, yeah, they were definitely on our email list. And these days, actually, I would say we have a really good balance of we still cater to the technical people. We still love writing gear reviews, software reviews, stuff like that. But we do a lot more around just general growth, how to grow your podcast, how to how to launch a podcast, how to make it sound better without much work, that kind of stuff. So yeah, they definitely joined our audience over time. And, and now that is the main lead generator for Alitu, really. During that, the last couple of years as you've been growing this, was there a time when it was so slow that you thought about shutting it down or that you really had a lot of maybe mental or emotional distress around it? Yeah. Do you know what though? The, it was never the... It was never the the times where it was slow that made me want to shut it down. Actually, I was always quite, like I said, we always I always felt like we were making progress. I always felt like we were making something great with Ala too. I just I love the interface. I use it for my own shows. That was a big part of the development around it was to make my own production easier too. So I was always quite happy with that. And we and I've always been very careful with the money we've put into it as well. So we've we've recruited slow. I had an impatience in the early days, but I remember I read a bunch of stories, probably heard on on your your own show as well, Rob, and, and elsewhere around people talking in years. Like I used to at various points, I used to think in months, like we'll get this done by this month, this done by this month. But then you hear the stories of really successful big companies, and they're all they all talk in years. We did this in twenty eighteen, we did this in twenty nineteen, and it it made me slow down my speed and be happy with that slower pace. And it was it was good because it helped. That never overwhelmed me. The the speed of growing users actually it, it frustrated me potentially because I you'd always want more users obviously. But then the points where I actually felt almost ready to shut it down are when we've had troubles that caused a bunch of customer support. So, for example, one of our one of our biggest mistakes was changing our interface in a way that I thought would really help users. I knew it would help me. It was the way I thought. And we changed the interface in quite a big way at one point on the editing screen. And the, the outcry was absolutely crazy. It turned out that more than half of our users much preferred the old method. And we had weeks and weeks of kind of repair and, and thinking through how we compromise and do we compromise and all that kind of stuff. It's times like that where I think, do you know what? I, I write content. We get affiliate income through that. We get sponsorship. All of that is completely passive. I don't need to deal with customers. I could go back to that. But I do I do love helping people in that way, like helping them make their podcasts easier. So that gets me through. But certainly it's, it's it was always that rather than the growth speed that that almost made me want to give up. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really healthy way to look at it. And I have verbiage in both the intro startups for the rest of us from time to time, as well as MicroConf on air that says, we want to build ambitious startups, but we think in terms of years, not months. And as such, we play the long game and don't burn ourselves out by working 90 hour weeks or something to that effect. And that, that really plays into what you're talking about is, you know, you see Josh Pigford from Bear Metrics just sold Bear Metrics yesterday, actually, I, I think it became public. And that was a seven year journey for him. And even, even drip, which seemed really fast was, uh, from the time we broke ground on code was three and a half years. And that was three and a half years to, to sale, you know, to exit. And that was a re- one of the faster stories that, you know, that I've heard about something. So the fact that you're, I mean, you're two years in, I have to imagine that while obviously COVID has been a, a catastrophe for the world, the acceleration of your growth over the past four or five months has to have felt like you're on cloud nine. I mean, is this like one of the most exciting times of running this business? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've we've taken on 
another four staff in the last three months. We've taken a part-time support person full-time. We've taken on a full-time marketer for the first time. We've we've taken on community and social marketer as well and, and another developer as well to help us with our audio side of things. So that's that's exciting. But I am at the moment thinking, I mean, we've absolutely the, the income, the extra income has helped us do that. But we could hire more. I, I do think we have a little bit of space to hire more. But just right at the moment, I just think the unpredictability is so high over the next six to 12 months that I, I'm definitely leaving a bit of wiggle room in our income. I don't expect to grow as fast, certainly. I mean, we doubled in three months. It was absolutely crazy. But I do not expect, in fact, the growth has already dropped a lot compared to that. We're still growing steadily, but certainly not that fast. And I think it might slow down even more over the winter, certainly. So I, I'm leaving a lot of wiggle room. <laughs> but yeah, it, it has been absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Did anything break at the seams when you doubled in three months? Was, was there support tickets falling on the ground? Did any of your tech have any issues? Yeah, support tickets were certainly taking longer than we thought. We had a little bit of scalability. Do you know what? It wasn't even so much actually the, the infrastructure scalability. It was more our capacity to troubleshoot. One of our things, one of the reasons why it's worth going slow with, certainly with ours is that audio is so unpredictable. Like we deal with so many different types of audio files, so many different types of recordings, and we're always working on improving how we clean up files, how we deal with different files, all that kind of stuff. And we have... We only have one developer who is a real kind of audio expert in that sense. So it was really his time to be able to troubleshoot twice as many little audio niggles, little audio queries. That was it. That was our our biggest trouble, <laughs> which is why we took on another audio developer. So yeah, there was there was definitely a fair few issues, <laughs> but we've got past most of them now, thankfully. I mean, you've obviously had pretty amazing success. You know, even though. It may sound like it was a, a slower start given the, the large audience that you had back in 2018. Being at 45K MRR after two years is is amazing. I mean, most businesses, most SaaS businesses we know about, just they never make it that far. But I'm curious if you've ever thought, did you build the right product? Because Alitu is, is editing software, but you could have in 2018 decided to launch a hosting company. You could have decided to build podcast recording, much like Squadcast or Zencaster. You know, there, there are a lot of different options for you to, a lot of different roads or paths for you to have gone down to serve your podcasting audience. Have you ever sat and thought, did I build the right product or could I potentially have more success if I had gone down one of these other paths? Yeah, yeah, for sure I have. And I think I did. I think I built the right product for, for me. I think I've heard you, I'm sure it's yourself, I've heard talk about Rob, the, the product founder fit. Is that, was that your concept? I think it was someone else, maybe Justin Jackson, but I even think someone had said it before him and he's, he's just done a lot of writing on it. But yep, and I'm definitely familiar with it. Yeah, well, I th I'm sure I've heard of it through yourself, certainly. And I, I think that is really, that's important to me, actually, because I, like I said, I, I tried hosting years back and I just didn't enjoy the support, the customer questions, the, the stuff that came, th that came about, you know, around that area. Editing, production, creating is the stuff that I love. That's, that's kind of, that's why I created the podcast host in the first place, the website. And I think I could have created a hosting platform. I could have created a recording platform right at the start. But I think certainly with hosting, I don't know, I don't have the aptitude for that <laughs> to compete in what is quite a commoditized space. There was already a lot of competition there, for example. And there's always room for more, for sure. But I enjoy I enjoy the uniqueness of Alitu. When we started it, there was nothing else like it on the market. Even now, there's nothing really doing exactly what we do. And I really enjoy that. And, and I really enjoy the feedback we get when people get in there and suddenly they can, they can edit in such an easy way and they can, they can create this vision that they had in their head without all the stress around learning things like audacity and stuff like that. It's just, it's something that gives me so much satisfaction and, and I love it. And that's, that's what keeps me going. I mean, like, like we've talked about, there's been a few hard points, more than a few hard points. It's been slow growth. I could have given up it many times, but that's kind of what keeps me going, I think. It's just that that feedback. It's that it just suits my aptitude to create a product that helps people create. Yeah, that's really cool to hear, actually. It's like a life vision or, or mission that you have, and it fits so well within that, it sounds like. And it brings you joy to be working on a on this particular SaaS app, which I think is is pretty unique. You know, a lot of people 
enjoy what they're doing. I en- I've enjoyed building my SaaS apps, but I don't know if it actually fit into my personal, you know, and professional vision in the way that, that Alitu fits into yours. So congratulations on that. And frankly, congratulations on, on all your success. If folks want to keep up with you, you are at Colin Mick Gray on Twitter or the podcast host on Twitter, as well as the podcast host.com. Colin, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Rob. It was great fun. Cheers. Thanks again to Colin for coming on the show. If you have a question for me or a future guest, please send it into questions at startupsfortherestofus.com. If you include a link to an audio file, that will go to the top of the stack. I hope your 2021 is doing better than our collective 2020 went. And I do hope to see you at an in-person event, maybe a microconf or maybe another startup event here in the next 12 months. Thanks so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time.